summer weather in January and a drought on tap in California. Governor Brown asks everyone to reduce their water use by 20%. Airbnb makes couch surfing profitable and controversial. We talk with company founder Brian Chesky. We have this vision that you can be home anywhere around the world. Plus, will the latest tech boom transform San Francisco's gritty Tenderloin district? It's the one neighborhood in San Francisco that cannot be gentrified. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Earlier today, Governor Jerry Brown declared a drought emergency. Because we're facing uh, perhaps the worst uh, drought that uh, California has ever seen since records uh, began uh, being kept about 100 years ago. 2013 was the driest year on record in California, and forecasters don't see much rain on the horizon. Joining me now to discuss the impact of this are Heather Cooley, co-director of the Pacific Institute's Water Program, Chris Brown, executive director of the California Urban Water Conservation Council, and Lauren Summer, KQED science reporter. Lauren, let's begin with you. What does the drought declaration made by Governor Brown uh, trigger on a statewide level, and does it affect uh, federal aid for California at all? Well, today was largely political. I mean, it's no secret. It's been incredibly dry. California's in a drought. But it was a really a big gesture that the governor was making today, sending a signal saying, we're going to have to conserve, and things are going to get tougher. Um, they, he did set out a few things, making water transfers a little bit easier. That's where people that have excess water can sell that water to people that are in need of it. So he's trying to speed those things along. And it, he, he, he set up a little bit more flexibility for state agencies that are going to have to make some of these decisions later in the year. But um, federal aid, it comes largely from the USDA in terms of farm programs. Um, it was just this week that the U.S. Department of Agriculture said 27 California counties are in natural disaster areas. So certainly the farmers are going to be looking to a lot of those federal programs coming up. And uh, Senator Feinstein, I, I read, had uh, asked President Obama to step in as well. And so today's declaration should maybe um, speed that process along. Uh, uh, Lauren, I, Chris, I want to ask uh, you this. We, we've, um, the governor wants 20 percent water reduction. A lot of people have already over the years put in uh, things like low flush toilets and low flow shower heads. What else can people do to cut water usage by 20 percent? Yeah, actually, for those who have done a lot, um, it may take a bigger uh, effort, but a lot of this is behavior. We really are kind of, we're not mindful about the way we use water on a daily basis. We do let it run. We may have leaks around the house. There are little things we can do. We are, have a law now that allows us to put uh, gray water, the water from our clothes washing or from our shower, out on the lawn, but very few people actually do that. So there are things that you can do the average person that lives off the grid on rainwater, they don't have a well, they don't have access to municipal water, uses between 30 and 35 gallons a day. In municipal California, even in very conserving areas, um, it's closer to 100 gallons a day. So if you just cut your showers down to, say, five minutes, how, how much water would that save? Oh, th that's just going to be a few gallons per shower, uh, maybe four or five gallons per shower. But it's actually the little things that we forget to do, like, not rinsing dishes off before you put them in the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. They don't need rinsing before you put them in the dishwasher. The dishwasher will wash your dishes even without rinsing. So there's little things like that that we're using water every day that we just kind of lost track of how much water that really adds up to. But, but also too, while some people have installed the more efficient devices in their home, many have not. And so there are tremendous opportunities for those who have not to put in front loading clothes washers, to put in more um, high efficiency dishwashers. So there are opportunities there, certainly. There are new, more efficient devices that have been developed over the last several years um, beyond ultra uh, low flush, um, high efficiency shower heads, high efficiency toilets. So there's significant opportunities 
there. Um, we have opportunity in our landscape. We still have a tremendous amount of lawns. About half of all urban water use in California is outdoors. Mm -hmm. And so there's an opportunity, maybe not to take out your entire lawn, but certainly sections of it um, and put in more drought tolerant landscapes. And in our businesses, our um, we can be using in our restaurants, in our hotels, um, schools, all of these facilities have the opportunity to save water. So we've been talking about average consumers and businesses, but really the folks who use the most water in this state are farmers. They use about 80% of the state's water. Um, have they done enough to, to change the way they use water and use it more wisely? I don't think anyone's done enough yet. Um, that being said, there are many innovative farmers in California. They are using much more drip irrigation than they were five or 10 years ago. Um, they're using advanced irrigation scheduling, advanced technologies to apply water um, when it's needed and to apply the right amount. That being said, we still have tremendous amounts of acreage in California that uses flood irrigation, that uses inefficient sprinklers. And so there are opportunities there as well. But I think we're really going to see some of those old tensions crop up again. You know, Northern California versus Southern California, world versus urban. You know, we're already kind of seeing these themes kind of come up again. But a lot has changed since the last drought. I mean, Southern California has made big inroads in terms of urban water conservation. You know, that's a little bit different from the narrative from the last drought. Lauren, give me the big perspective here. You're the, you're the science reporter, and from the aerial photos I've seen, you you can see how dry California is. The Sierra snowpack is only 17% of normal. You see very dry farmland. How bad is this situation, and why do we have such a bad drought? Yeah, there, it's break, gonna break some records. I think a lot of people are saying, you know, if we go way back 1976 to 77, it is the record for most severe drought, but we're, we're on track to break that record. Um, what's happening is that there's a high pressure ridge that's kind of sitting off the coast. It's it's called the uh, ridiculously resilient ridge. I almost missed that one. <laughs> that um, was great. You got that right. <laughs> I know. It's a uh, it's kind of like a linebacker sitting out there blocking the storms that would normally be coming into Northern California. And so the forecast is really dry. And and the forecast that people have looked at, even you know more advanced forecasts a few months out, it's still looking very dry. But why? I mean, is a global warming a factor, or is it just sheer bad luck? What's going on? Well, we do know that climate change is affecting all of our weather. So these are the types of events that are going to become more frequent and more intense. So we need to begin integrating that into our, our planning to begin preparing for, you know, not a one or a two year, but a three or a four or five, even a 10 year drought. So this is the beginning. This is an opportunity for us. There's a lot of interest, a lot of focus on how do we use and manage water better. This is an opportunity to implement the short term, but more importantly, the long term measures that are going to be saving us water five and 10 and 15 years out. You know, one thing you can do around the house if you're if you do have a lawn is recognize that this is the time of year even when we're not having rain that because of the cool temperatures your plants are not actually using a lot of water mm -hmm. so saving water now means it's going to be there for the hotter drier parts of the year as well a lot of what we've gotten into is a habit of using water year round and th if we're going to have one year after another of dry weather we're going to have to learn to use water when we really need it not during the winter time when it's not really needed by the plants at all. So those are things that we all need to do. Uh, in the meantime, the environment is already affected. Lauren, how is this affecting cattle and fish? We're starting to really see those effects already. Certainly ranchers are feeling the pain. Um, they rely on a lot of green winter pasture. And if, if you've seen the hills around the Bay Area, not so green right now. Um, salmon as well. I mean, the American River is incredibly dry. There's already concerns about the salmon runs up there, the salmon that have laid their eggs. So um, we're starting to see the beginning of it and it, it's expected to get a lot worse. So this will perhaps hurt the fishing industry, the women, the, the men uh, who rely on this uh, to make a living. Will we see higher food prices as well? It's possible. We, uh, depending on the sort of crops that are grown, depending on, on other global conditions, we may indeed see higher uh, food prices. We will definitely see high, higher electricity prices. Um, hydroelectric power will be down because there simply is not water to run through the turbines. Um, hydropower tends to be among our, our cheapest form of electricity. So if that electricity isn't there, we will have to buy it on the market at higher price. And politically, there uh, seem to be perhaps some ramifications already. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown had been shying away from the idea of a water bond on this year's ballot because he's uh, presumably, presumably running for re-election and it's a, and not something that a lot of voters support. Do you think this drought will now 
change that, shift the public attitude toward that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, this was an $11 billion bond that was written back in 2009. It didn't go on the ballot the last two times because there didn't seem to be enough support for it. It has projects like big water storage project, restoration projects, and right now the state legislature is rewriting it. So some people are saying we've got to get this thing passed because we need to invest in the water system. There's also a lot of resistance, so we'll see what happens this year. And. Uh, are there barriers to change the way that people view water and how they use water? It, it does seem like it requires a whole cultural shift. Oh, absolutely. We have a lot of problems in this state. One, we view each other as two different states, Northern California and Southern California. But we also based our water rights on something called prior appropriation. The people who got here first, because they had invested time and were concerned about that investment of time and money, set up a water right system that now it's first in time. And people are very jealous about those water rights. So that's what you see happening right now in the suburbs of Sacramento. They're already in severe rationing of water because they've grown in the areas that are the most recently built and therefore they have the least amount of water rights. And so we're gonna see more of that happening uh, as the years go on, especially if we have one dry year after another. All right, in the meantime, we will keep our fingers crossed and hope that a miracle march does indeed happen with a lot of rainfall. Uh, Heather Cooley, Lauren Summer, and Chris Brown, thank you all. Thank you. And still to come, is San Francisco's Tenderloin neighborhood immune to gentrification? But first, since its founding in 2008, Airbnb has gone from a scrappy upstart listing vacation rentals to an international powerhouse shaking up the travel industry. People use the b, &B Airbnb to list online more than 500 million accommodations in nearly 200 countries, from rooms and homes to private castles. As the San Francisco-based company grows, it's facing criticism from the hotel industry, saying Airbnb is avoiding taxes. Earlier today, Scott Schaefer sat down with co-founder and CEO Brian Chesky. Brian Chesky, welcome. Thank you. So there was a, a report out this week from Boston University School of Management shows that Airbnb listings are taking a bit of a, a bite out of hotels uh, in places where they're advertised. And I'm wondering, do, does Airbnb see itself as competing with, uh, with hotels the same way that, say, Amazon did with independent bookstores? I don't think so. I think that Airbnb is really an experience driven company and we are a little bit of a slice of adventure. We really allow you to feel like you live like a local. Imagine you could feel like you live in that city and hotels, most hotels you typically stay for three nights. Average stay at Airbnb is closer to a week. We have a lot more international travel and I you know, read that same report. And Frankly, I don't think it has a lot of cannibalizing, um, cannibalizing effects. I like to think that we start to compete with people just staying home, frankly, because a lot of people are traveling for the very first time. So what we're creating is a lot of incremental travel. There is, of course, a big trust factor yeah, totally. uh, in the sharing economy generally, but you've, you're inviting people into your home, you're going into people's homes. How do you negotiate all that, and how has that changed in terms of the way Airbnb deals with that? Well, I think that trust is the currency that allows this economy to be able to flourish. and so. We created Airbnb, there were a couple core tenets. First, profiles. Every single person had to have a profile. And so everyone at Airbnb has a profile and you can learn about them. The second is you have reviews. Reviews are bi-directional, so when I stay with you, I leave you a review, you leave me a review. Over time, these reviews are a way of accumulating trust. And the third is it's a transaction. So um, these reviews are transactional, so they can only be done through a secure payment system. So um, you can't just leave an unsolicited review. Yeah. Of course, you have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, using Airbnb. Yep. Uh, and, and this is just one anecdote we got. We asked our listeners and our viewers to yeah. get, send us their stories. And regarding reviews, one person said, you know, I had a pretty good experience. I left a review of the host that was mostly favorable, but not entirely favorable. And then the host started harassing her mm. uh, because she didn't like the review. She was afraid it would be bad for business. Right, right. So how do you deal with that interaction afterwards right. between the host and the guest. Well, incredibly important is our ability to be a mediator. So we have a 24-7 customer support line where um, we're in, you know, in 20 or so languages around the world. And so here in San Francisco, the really great thing is that there's recourse for both sides. So if either side has an issue, we're there to step in and we'll do whatever we can to make things right for both parties. So like we really try to see things. So, well, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it's very rare that it happens, but if something were to happen, we're there. There have been some places, New York in particular, right. where there's been a lot of tension between yeah. the hotel industry 
and Airbnb. The Attorney General of New York got involved and yep. there was talk about collecting hotel taxes, occupancy taxes. Your position changed on that. Uh, initially, you, you were either quiet about it, but then recently, in October, I think, you said this is, this is the correct way to go. Tell me where you, where you stand now, the company, and how you're implementing that. Well, our position never changed. It was just a matter of um, us making a bigger commitment. So we've always asked our users, our hosts, to be able to comply with local laws and regulations. And we weren't, you know, we didn't have to collect and remit or kind of streamline that process of local taxes in New York. But we decided after spending a lot of time in New York that we wanted to go further than what the really the law compelled us to do. And so we wanted to really aid in the host, being able to streamline this process. And I think the core problem here is um, there are laws for people, there are laws for businesses. When they look at the sharing economy, when you look at Airbnb, you ask what bucket do they fit into? And sometimes they don't fit in either bucket. There's a third bucket, people as businesses. So they're not necessarily a business like Airbnb, but they're not a person that's not doing business. So will Airbnb actually collect the tax the way a hotel does, or you're gonna leave it up to the hosts? I think that we haven't even gone down that road yet of the, that level of detail. Uh, the most important thing is our commitment. Our commitment is being great partners with cities. We want them to want us in cities, and we want to enrich them, so, you know, strengthen them. You're in 192 countries, I think. 190, actually. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, there's many different ways of being a host, and right. it varies depending on the culture and the place. So how do you establish a, uh, you know, a, an experience for the user that is uh, not standard necessarily, but predictable, right. maybe? There have to be predictable standards and expectations. We don't want uh, it to be a one-size-fits-all experience. We want to celebrate the uniqueness for which there's only one of this experience in the entire world. Every person's different and unique, but we have nine hospitality standards. We actually hired the former head of Joie de Vie Hotel Group, which you may know here in San Francisco, Chip Conley, who created the Phoenix Hotel and Hotel Vital, and we brought him in, and he's our hospitality visionary, and there are nine hospitality standards, communication, cleanliness, check-in, and you can provide a unique experience, but there's a minimum threshold that everyone has to yeah. uphold. You and I have something in common. We were both born in remote towns in New York State. You're from <laughs> yes. Niskayuna. Niskayuna. And I'm from Tonawanda. Yes. Wow. I checked on Airbnb. There's actually 11 listings in Niskayuna. That, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> the funny thing is, I like to tell people, where'd you grow up? And they t tell us, maybe suggest an obscure hometown. And I say, I bet you. You'll have a list. We'll have a listing Airbnb. I don't think I've been wrong yet. So that suggests we're in 34,000 different cities around the world. Yeah, and just real quick, what does it look like? What does the future look like? I think this future looks like us expanding this idea of Airbnb into even more places because we have this vision that you can be home anywhere around the world. All right, Brian Chesky, Airbnb. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. The latest tech boom transforming parts of the Bay Area is edging closer to San Francisco's least affluent neighborhood, the Tenderloin. But as correspondent Spencer Michaels reports, history and politics may make change in the area nearly impossible. The Tenderloin has long been viewed as San Francisco's armpit. Drug dealing and drunks, prostitution, the homeless and mentally ill, troubled veterans and impoverished new immigrants right next door to the city's thriving downtown. Today, about 28,000 people live in the 40-square-block area. Judy Young, executive director of the Vietnamese Youth Development Center, moved here from an Asian refugee camp in 1981. I was eight years old, and um, we live in this crappy one-bedroom, I think it was haunted apartment. And um, there was like six of us to, to a one-bedroom, and the neighborhood was um, the worst you could ever find. More than 30 years later, the downtrodden still line up for free meals at St. Anthony's Dining Hall in the heart of the Tenderloin. They serve 2,500 meals a day. St. Anthony's executive director, Barry Stanger, says the neighborhood has changed, though only subtly. The Tenderloin is changing in the sense that we're, we're seeing people now who are living their lives here, too, because of the, the work that housing advocates have done over the years. One of those advocates is Randy Shaw, longtime director of the Tenderloin Housing Clinic, one of many neighborhood nonprofits that own or operate housing. Buildings are in better condition than ever before. Uh, but I don't know that someone who hasn't been here in 10 years would notice a dramatic change. 
I've spent most of my life in and around San Francisco, and for all the changes that I've seen, the Tenderloin District has remained pretty much the same. While most cities have been quick to redevelop blighted areas near their downtowns, the Tenderloin has so far resisted. That's the view of San Francisco Magazine editor Gary Camilla. In his recent book, Cool Gray City of Love, he blames progressive forces and nonprofits for impeding progress and creating a museum of depravity in the Tenderloin. San Francisco is very left leaning. The nonprofits have a very strong political base in the city. To simply take an undesirable population and go warehouse them somewhere is, you know, it's extremely problematic. So that there's kind of a, you know, a, a, there's, there's an understandable reason to not want to make a dramatic change in the Tenderloin. In the middle of our interview, we were interrupted by one resident. Why do you I, live in the Tenderloin? Or why do, do I live in the Tenderloin? Yeah. Because we're flushed right. into the areas. Right. This is where we have to survive the best that right. we can. Why should we have to be sitting here going through the things that we don't want to do? We're going to jail for things that we don't even want to do. Gary Camilla blames the nonprofits who are providing services to residents like the man who goes by Dirty Red. What the nonprofits want to do is maintain their stake here. This is where they have their, their, their structures. They own or lease dozens of buildings and, and thousands of people are housed and supported here. They're being part of the solution, but ironically, they're also part of the problem. The city uh, is very loath to step in and say, let's sweep this all away. Let's move it somewhere else. What about the nonprofits? Do, do they have a stake and they want to keep things the way they are? No, that's absolutely false. I mean, nobody has spent more time than me trying to reduce crime in the Tenderloin. I had, the, I had a large nonprofit. I led an anti crime march to the Tenderloin with Diane Feinstein in 1985. That's a long time we've been fighting it. it, it the problem has been that the police allow activities to go on to the Tenderloin, they don't allow in other neighborhoods. You gotta get off the sidewalk, guys. Come on. For their part, the police say they devote plenty of resources to the Tenderloin, with frequent street patrols and a special unit housed in the neighborhood. But according to Captain Jason Chernus, the basic problems here are not law enforcement issues. Public safety doesn't belong to the police. Public safety belongs to cooperation between the police and the community. And when people get to, get to kind of realize that, then we see success. If the environment is comfortable for drug dealers and drug trafficking, removing that drug dealer is, is, is only going to uh, take that one drug dealer off the street, but the environment still stands. As for why not more arrests? Now, if you're not used to seeing people who, you know, who are mentally ill, who don't smell good, who are incontinent, who talk to themselves, those are things that could scare you, yes. But we don't criminalize homelessness in San Francisco. And that, you know, is different from other places in, the, uh, in California and, and in the United States. And some, some people find that shocking. But not all Tenderloin residents are homeless or mentally ill. The area is home to immigrants from Southeast Asia and Latin America looking for cheaper housing until they can get on their feet. At least 2,000 children live here like Judy Young used to. Families do live here because it is one of the most affordable places in the city. And people don't realize how high the housing is in San Francisco. And so if you can find an, a studio or one bedroom here now for $1,200, that's pretty affordable compared to other places. With tech companies like Twitter opening up shop in the nearby mid-market corridor, the question remains, will gentrification price out those who need the Tenderloin's low rents? Randy Shaw says that can't happen. The Tenderloin has been, for the last really almost 100 years, a working class neighborhood, and now it's become San Francisco's last working class neighborhood and the last it'll ever have because it's the one neighborhood in San Francisco that cannot be gentrified for a number of reasons, land use protections, zoning protections, rent controls, and a unique housing stock which has no single family homes, or actually there's one single family home in the Tenderloin, has a very small number, less than five flats. So the gentry who like to own do not have ownership opportunities in the Tenderloin. Staples of that unique housing stock are a hundred single-room occupancy hotels, SROs. Their status is protected by city laws that make it impossible to tear them down and replace them with upscale apartments, as is happening in the Mission District. 
Change, of course, will come to San Francisco. It is happening now. And the city will try to improve life in the Tenderloin. But the betting is this neighborhood will remain unique, fascinating, and a seamy, sometimes unsafe refuge for the poor. And that was Spencer Michaels reporting. Joining me now for a look at some of the other stories we're watching is Scott Schaefer. Hi, Scott. Hey, Twee. So a uh, big political announcement this week from Abel Maldonado, the former lieutenant governor. Uh, he was running for um, governor and decided to drop out. What happened? He did. Well, you know, in a nutshell, Abel was unable to raise any money and get any traction. Uh, you'd think he'd be the kind of candidate the Republican Party would like. He's a moderate uh, Latino, but, you know, the base of the party, the conservatives, have never really trusted him. And so he just decided, why waste my time, basically? Well, and he also uh, angered his own party when he struck a, uh, a tax-raising budget deal with the Democrats. Um, who does this now leave against Jerry Brown? We're assuming he will run for re-election. It's a thin field. You've got Assemblyman Tim Donnelly, who's a Tea Party favorite, very conservative, going to turn out uh, a lot of Latinos to vote against him because he started the Minutemen. Uh, but then you've got somebody in the wings who could be very interesting, a moderate sort of liberal Republican on social issues, Neil Kashkari, uh, who some feel could be a very appealing face of the party, a new generation of leaders. So we'll have to see if he jumps in. Uh, another big piece of political news uh, this week, Congressman George Miller of Martinez, uh, one of the most influential and senior members of uh, Congress, said he's retiring after 40 years. Was it somewhat of a surprise announcement? It was somewhat of a surprise, yeah. You know, he, everyone just expects these uh, old veterans are going to run again, and he just decided uh, it was time to go, go home and stay home. Uh, so it's a big loss in terms of seniority. There's one person lined up, uh, Mark DeSaunier, the Contra Costa County State Senator, lined up to run. It's a safe seat. The Democrats aren't going to lose it. Uh, but uh, for sure, it's a loss of clout uh, in Congress. And I want to talk real quickly about the NSA as well. President Obama, of course, uh, made an announcement on that today, announcing some changes to the surveillance program, but largely leaving the program intact. What has been the initial reaction from Silicon Valley companies? They're disappointed. You know, they liked what they heard, but they want a lot more detail. They're worried about their business. You know, they have a lot of business overseas, and companies are worried that their data that they put in the cloud or whatever is not going to be secure. And so it's a, it's a big problem. They want to see more protection so that they feel confident going to their international uh, business clients and, and, and really giving them a, a guarantee that their, their data, their information is going to be secure. And of course, some of the heads of the biggest Silicon Valley companies did go to Washington recently to make their case known. We'll see how it all shakes out. Absolutely. All right, Scott, thank you. And for all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tui Vu. Have a good night.